someone has to kind of pay the condo fees of global leadership. So it's either us or it's going to be somebody else. Now, I would strongly prefer that it's somebody else. I'm Raj Kumar, and you're in the DevX Book Club. Maybe you're a global development nerd like me. Maybe you work at the UN or at an NGO. Or maybe you're just excited to hear from some of the world's leading authors on the most important issues of the day. Either way, you're in the right place. Grab a snack, get a comfortable seat, and don't worry if you haven't read the book. You're very much welcome. Get ready for our discussion. This week's book club author is Dan Rundy. Dan is the person I call when I want to know what Republican leaders are thinking and doing about global development policy behind the scenes. He's the senior vice president and the William A. Schreier chair in global analysis at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In his new book, The American Imperative, Dan makes the case for building a new global consensus on the U.S. use of soft power, really to confront a rising China. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. This is great. What a great space. It's a nice setup, right? It is a nice setup. And it's nice to do it in person. It's great to see you. Congrats on finishing this book. Oh, my word. How long did it take you? I made a commitment December 2019, and I submitted the final manuscript March of early March of 2022. Okay. So like first week of so a year ago. It's interesting because you and I come from opposite sides yeah, of the political spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And I found myself agreeing with so many things you had to say in this book. Thank you. And the first thing that comes through is just the people who have endorsed the book, the people who have blurbed it. I mean, you know, I know you as a kind of the Republican leader on these issues in town, right? But for those who don't, I see, you know, John Bolton and Paul Wolfowitz and H.R. McMaster and Elliot Abrams and Paul Dobrian. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It's sort of like the who's who in conservative circles. Yeah who have said, hey, this is a book to pay attention to. Yeah. And I thought that's particularly important because it, we, we've had a couple of decades of bipartisan consensus yeah. around foreign assistance. Totally. That has started to fall away. Yeah, and, I know. And it seems to me like you, you describe yourself in the book as a conservative internationalist. Totally. And it seems like you're trying to forge some new bipartisan consensus. And I think that's really fascinating. I want to kind of get yeah. into your head about... What's going on in the Republican Party? What's going on in the conservative movement? Yeah. And where where might we go to to create some new consensus? And what are some of the upsides and downsides of that? So I'm I'm thrilled to Thanks. to get to talk to you about this book because I think it's really important Thank at this you. time. Thank you. It's my kid. It's like the <laughs> doing this for it's like twenty years in Washington. That's what it is. That's what the book is. Well, let's start with that. Like, what's your backstory? You know, you talk a little bit about in in the book about being influenced by the book The Ugly American. Oh yeah. But but how did you even decide you wanted to dedicate your career and work to global development? What's the where where did yeah. Dan Rundy come from and and get into this line of work? Well, thanks. I I was thinking about beforehand like the, your backstory and and your talent. I remember you telling me a story about being in line at the Kennedy School and meeting your wife. And so my backstory is I grew up in New York and um, I went to school at Dartmouth and I, I, I studied abroad. I liked Spanish and it liked me. I did a couple internships in Washington where I, uh, I worked in the Bush 41 White House. I love that. And I worked, I was a volunteer on the Bush 41 reelect campaign. I really liked that. And I saw everybody lose their jobs in 1992 because I was there in the fall of 1992. I was like, oh, I didn't like that. And so then I went to work on Wall Street for a while which I had kind of, it was sort of a, a mixed bag for me. It was a really useful experience, but I didn't love it. And uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So I spent a year in Spain. I took Spanish language class. I went, I had studied Spanish in college in Spain. So I went back to this place and I took the LSAT and the GRE and the GMAT. And then I thought about like, okay, what do I want to do? I want to go to law school. I want to go to an MBA. Do I want to go get an MPP? I really liked Kennedy school. And uh, so I went to the Kennedy school and after spending a year in Spain, so my Spanish was really good. It was like became it was kind of one of my superpowers. Is my Spanish is for for a, with a thick accent, it's pretty good, right? And so I met my wife the first day of class. Uh, she was in my what they call the cohort, and so I did classes with her. And then she's from Argentina, and then I did a um, I had did a big research project that they required you to do at the Kennedy School um, for Andrew Natsios, who became the head of USAID. And so I 
got my love life figured out and my work life figured <laughs> out at Harvard. So I'm like the poster child for the, the Harvard Kennedy School, I suppose. I've been at CSIS for about 12 and a half years now. And um, it's, been a, it's been a good run. It's been a good deal. It's been a deal, and it's been a good deal. Yeah, and, you, and you're known there for writing and speaking on development issues, some of which are you know broad and get picked up you know in more mainstream press, and some of which are really narrow and technical and detailed and nerdy that we'll get into yeah. in our discussion. One thing I noticed in your book, just thinking about your motivations for caring about the rest of the world, you talk about, at a pretty young age, going all around the former Soviet Union. I'd love to hear a little bit of that story. How did you end up traveling across Russia and the Soviet uh, Union? And how old were you when you did it? Yeah. What's, the, what's the backstory? So I was uh, I was 17. Um, I, I did a lot of, and my folks were really encouraging me to do a lot of international travel. My, um, my mother's older cousin had been in World War II, and he had been, um, and so he's related to this story. And he, um, he had been... Uh, he had joined the OSS and had gone to Yale to learn Japanese. It was the only place in the United States at the time you could learn Japanese was in Yale. And so he spoke super fluent Japanese. It must have been in his, like, 60s at the time, maybe late 60s. And um, he then became a journalist in the early – in the late 40s and kind of was in New York for about five years. And then he became a Catholic priest. So he was someone really close to my – he married my wife and me, and we were very close. And so, you know, my father had a lot of airline miles at the time. At the time, the airline miles were pretty – Lucy goosey and pretty generous. And so, um, so I went on probably like five or six different international trips to be kind of like his, like his sidekick. Um, and we went to different places. They needed a priest on a cruise ship one year. So I went, spent my Christmas and new years on doing three trips between Miami and the Bahamas with him. And so he wanted to go to the former Soviet union. He'd been there in the seventies. And so the two of us went on some kind of like guided tour of it was Uzbekistan, uh, Mongolia, Siberia, Moscow, and Leningrad with a Sovietologist, I, I guess is how you describe it now, from the University of Michigan. It was like 30 people. Super interesting. I was 17. It was a mind-blowing experience, right? And this was 1989. 89. Yeah, I'm 51 now. So it was a mind-blowing experience. So it was... I was kind of... I had kind of an international orientation for a long time. And, uh, and so I knew that... You know, I knew that. And then... Um, you know, living abroad uh, was really important to me. Living in Spain had a big impact on me. And then uh, living in Argentina and kind of marrying into kind of a, a country, you know, a family that, you know, spoke Spanish all the time. I just had kind of a sense we were interdependent and uh, you couldn't you couldn't just say, well, I'm going to, you know, if we could just stop all the airplane flights, we wouldn't have COVID or this kind of thing. Like you couldn't, you couldn't, that wasn't realistic. I think we underestimate the value of, the requirement of like someone has to kind of pay the condo fees of global leadership. And so someone's got to do that. So it's either us or it's going to be somebody else. Now I would strongly prefer that it's somebody else. And so, you know, I wrote the book because well, a couple of things when I've been at this think tank for 12 years, so I've got something to say and I've got some content, but the totality of it would just say, if after doing all that work, I would say, and it's all been around kind of soft power and kind of America's role in it. Some of it really nerdy and technical. And we can talk about that. And some of it kind of more zoomed out. We need American leadership for the thing to work. That the system we've got, whether it's kind of like global trade or public health or um, peace or uh, any kind of the international system, which is kind of a fancy term, is requires American leadership. I would also argue, and maybe this is a little bit provocative, uh, is that I think that global development, as I understand it, is a way of plugging countries into into modernity. And so, and I would argue that that modernity is kind of a Western-led modernity. And so there's a competition of systems. And so I'd like to have as many countries and people as possible plug into the to the operating system we've already got. It's imperfect, but... It's we won't like the alternative if either we're going to lead it or China, the Chinese Communist Party and with its sidekick, Vladimir Putin and his murderous regime are going to set up some alternative system that's going to have a lot of implied badness in it. I, I've been trying to avoid saying we're in a second Cold War because I think it's pretty that's a pretty jacked up term. That's pretty that's pretty provocative. And I've had that asked a couple of times. But I'd say I'm hoping we're not there. I'm not saying I'm in denial about it. But I think if you believe we're in a period of great power competition, we're certainly in a kind of frostier relations with the Chinese Communist Party and 
Vladimir Putin's murderous regime, then I would argue that the, that competition is not going to play out in China. That competition is not going to play out in Russia. It's going to play out in Africa. It's going to play out in Latin America. It's going to play out in Southeast Asia. It's going to play out in Central Asia. It's going to play out in Ukraine and Moldova and the Caucasus and the Pacific Islands. And most of it is not going to be military. So, yes, there's we see on the front page, the front page stuff. Now, for the DevEx listeners, your, their, your front page is all the other stuff that I'm that I'm talking about. And I think I know some people are going to say, look, I don't want to be some pawn in some bigger geostrategic game. But let me tell a story because I think to make this point. So during COVID, we all had COVID. We all had the vaccines. You know, we so if you're in a developed country, you kind of got to the front of the line for 10 different reasons. Like you cost share, or you put the money up front, or I'll, I'll make my my scientists available, whatever. The, there was some public health deal where somehow the U.S. got first dibs and the developed world got first dibs. So there was, and if I'm an elected official, I'm picking Pittsburgh over Paraguay for the vaccines. It's just, that's just the, the vaccine nationalism. It's really hard to break that the iron law vaccine unless you're an authoritarian regime. Russia and China specifically held back vaccinating their own populations so they could export vaccines in places like El Salvador. El Salvador in the last six or seven years has recognized mainland China as opposed to Taiwan. So they got the crappy Sinovac vaccine. Guatemala and Honduras recognize Taiwan. They got nothing. So they were like, hey, United States, we're recognizing Taiwan. And our answer was, hey, sorry, man, you got to wait. Like our public health people have like a little book and like, you know, you can take a number and we'll give you one of those buzzers at like TGI Fridays and we'll buzz you when the vaccines are ready. And that was like going to be like a year from now. It seemed as if else for some reason, El Salvador's border towns with Guatemala had massive vaccine campaigns coordinated with the Chinese Communist Party. You'd, it's almost as if they were sort of saying to Guatemala, well, if you recognize uh, us, we'll give you the vaccines. So my point is, I think China and somewhat Russia have an ability, ability to fill that voids they couldn't 15 or 20 years ago. And so my, that's my point, that there's enough power. China has got enough power along with Russia, whether it's digital, whether it's vaccines, whether it's infrastructure. Sometimes it's about values. Sometimes it's disinformation. Uh, sometimes it's multilateral system. Sometimes it's international education and training. But if you add these building blocks up and we let them, those are the building blocks of building a different kind of a, a rule system, a different kind of an arrangement, a different kind of international order, which is like the fancy term for this. So the international order isn't just kind of like one thing. It's like Legos and you build up different pieces of it. And so I talk about several, not all, but many of the Lego pieces that kind of, that would be required to, you know, to, to build a different kind of an arrangement. Yeah, I mean, there was a time not long ago when there would be a natural audience for that argument inside your party. Yeah. And there could be, you know, there were people on the Hill, like, you know, Richard Luger and others who John were- John McCain. John McCain, who were like you, they probably would have described themselves as conservative internationalists, yeah. you know, they- they cared about America's leadership role in the world. Is the argument you're making as compelling as it is now, is there an audience for it inside the Republican Party? In a way, I wonder if like the conservative internationalist is kind of a unicorn, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to spot in the wild. Yeah. Um, and, and do you think that as compelling as it might be that you can, that there are people ready to listen to this argument and that we yeah. can use it to forge that new, coalition. Yeah. Thanks. So I think that's a really good question. I think that, and it's one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, was because of this concern I have. So I think a couple of things happened. I think the Iraq war and I think Afghanistan somewhat, and then the 2008 financial crisis were all kind of body blows to a number of things. One was a, a body blow to concepts like, well, believing in supporting kind of the cause of democracy and human rights. Some of it got kind of like caught up with, with some of that. And I think it was com somewhat conflated if I can use that that, that think tank word. And then I'd also say that the, the financial crisis of 2008 really kind of, there'd been sort of in the post Soviet period, it was sort of like, okay, well, we're going to just have globalization's going to kind of 
we're going to plug these countries into the develop into our system. They'll become responsible stakeholders, which was the thesis about China. And then these countries just are going to kind of have convergence and we're going to do a little bit of development and they're going to become more democratic. Now, I think there's some, a lot of truth to that still. It's just, it's a, it's a scratchier, bumpier, longer road than I think we assume. I, I actually am a long-term optimist that the, the arc of history bends towards markets and bends towards democracy and better human treating people better and, and better governance. I think those are all over time things we, we should aspire to, but we have to work at. And it's like diabetes. We have to kind of ma maintain, you can, you can, you know, things like corruption, we don't eradicate. We have to kind of manage. Uh, it's not a permanent fix. Um, there was, there was also a, kind of an instinct. I wasn't fully articulated. So we would like to renegotiate the terms of the arrangement on burden sharing. If you look at all of the actions, the totality of the Trump administration's actions, it, it would not, it, I don't think it's fair to say that they were, I, I did, was not a big Trump person, but I would just say that um, if, if you wanted to take a charitable view, it was like, we would like to renegotiate burden sharing on defense and other things with our, with our global partners. And that was, and I, I think you could even argue some of those policies you see kind of play out in the Biden administration as well. And not everything, it's sort of, but I would just say that there's a variety of things that sort of speak to that. So I think- You're thinking of things like Trump saying, NATO's got to pay, you know, other countries pay more yes, for NATO, right? Yes, that's, that's, this, that's the simple one. That's the, that's the but I think it, it, it's spoken different ways. But what I would say is, they went in, the Trump administration went in saying crazy things that I, I made me very uncomfortable and I, it made me kind of elicited, you know, a negative reaction from me. Uh, you know, they said, we're going to get rid of the U.S. Exim Bank. We're going to get rid of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which your listeners will know what they are. But, you know, the average person on the street may or may, may have heard of these things. They may not know exactly what they are. And then I don't know what happened, but I think they read intelligence reports. They got religion. A variety of things happened where they had their teeth kicked in and they said, Ooh, maybe this isn't such a good idea. So they said, we're going to get rid of the overseas private investment corporation. Then six months later, like, well, we're just kidding. We're actually going to put it on steroids and we're going to actually do something called the build act. And we're going to try and figure out like, you know, if it's a car, we're going to add leather seats and a CD player and a moonroof and a V6 engine. We're going to soup it up. And so I was involved with that. You know, I had done a series of reports over a number of years and testified a number of times. So anyway, so, I helped them with that. Uh, th that was the other thing I found at the Trump administration. There weren't a lot of thoughtful people who were willing to work with them. And I found that kind of strange. I mean, my view was like, if, if they're trying to do the right thing, like we should actually try and help them as opposed to like say, well, I'm not going to, they're inherently evil. So I'm not going to work with them. So I had several, many colleagues in the think tank world were kind of like on strike when they'd come and ask for help. And like, if they were trying to do the right thing, like why wouldn't we help them do the right thing? It's just as if I was the Obama administration or the Biden administration. Like, I don't understand why we wouldn't do that. Same with the Exim Bank. Like, let's get rid of the Exim Bank. I think that was classically dumb because there's a whole universe of things called export credit agencies. They're not exactly development, but they're like development's first cousin. And DFIs are kind of like, I don't know, like development's kind of like stepbrother, right? They're kind of fi high finance and they're kind of development. And your your readers know about it because you guys cover, have done a great job of covering development finance issues for many years and we're way ahead of the curve on these issues, Raj. And so um, uh, they turned around and said, we're gonna, because we're afraid of so what happened was in both the DFI case and the export credit agency case was like, oh my gosh, China is eating our lunch. And we couldn't just say, don't take the China money. Don't let the Chinese build that bridge. Don't have mainland. China. So then also with COVID, you couldn't say to them, don't take the mainland China vaccine. Don't take the mainland Chinese ventilator. Don't take the mainland China PPE. If we didn't, you can't fight something with nothing. And so what the Trump administration found in many international contexts, including in kind of the global development, but be, pl development plus, if I can describe it that way, when I call them soft power, but for sort of a short, it's like the 150 account for your listeners, but it's more than just the 150 account, which is the special category, as you know, Raja, the, the money we invest in development and diplomacy, it's other things, was that we couldn't tell people wait until you, and we can't now tell people wait 12 months for the vaccine in Guatemala. Like that, that's crap's not going to fly. Like, I think that's a problem and we're going to have to deal with it. 
So the other thing that happened was I think Republicans have kind of three views on the multilateral system. One is I got to get some permission slip from the French to protect myself. Hell no, I'm not going to do that. So that's one reaction. The other reaction is these guys, it's all worthless. It's all corrupt. They don't pay their parking tickets. It's a bunch of like pinstri- I own pinstripes, it's a bunch of pinstripe diplomats who are overpaid and on time tax free gravy train. I was on tax free gravy train. And this is totally worthless. Like these people do nothing. That's the second reaction. The third reaction is there's like various social issues. They're going to grab my guns or they're going to um, be mean to Israel. Like there were like, those are like, there's like kind of three quadrants of like complaint about the multilateral system from, from say Republicans. And it kind of creates kind of an analysis paralysis and it's kind of a virtue signal for Republicans. I think Republicans have Democrats have in progressive have their way of virtue signal. I think Repu- one of the ways Republicans and conservatives uh, virtue signal is saying how much they dislike the UN and the multilateral system and have a deep, deep skepticism of it. Hi, I'm Kate Warren, executive editor at DevEx. If you're listening to this podcast, you're likely working to achieve the sustainable development goals. But are you subscribed to DevEx Newswire? Global development can be a fast moving, complex sector. Our team of global reporters work every day to bring you the news you need to make sense of it all. In DevEx Newswire, we keep you up to date on issues ranging from climate change financing to gender equality and global health to transforming the food system, all in a fun to read free newsletter delivered directly to you five days a week. Join the hundreds of thousands of global development professionals who receive DevEx Newswire and visit devex.com slash newsletters to sign up to this free newsletter today. I, I guess one of the key things I want to get into is, you know, you're, you've done a great job outlining the Republican Party mindset. And, you know, let's say you succeed in shifting that mindset and we end up in this new era. So, you know, we had the Cold War era, Cold War ended. We had this 20 plus year period where there was a, a view about long term global development. There was a coalition of Christians and other faith groups and, you know, military and business leaders. And we had this big resurgence in, in U.S. foreign aid and in a sense that we could focus on the long term and not just our narrow foreign policy goals fighting the Soviet Union. Let's say you're right. That era has kind of wound down. Trump years were part mm. of it. Now we're entering maybe a new era where it's going to be about competition with China. What is that going to look like? Is there any worry in your mind that We'll go back to some of the Cold War period where the results of our development funding were were kind of less in focus and more in focus was alliances. You know, does Guatemala vote with us? Do so they we'll recognize give money. Taiwan? Yeah, Trans- we'll look the other way. Because you, you use in the book this idea that China is very transactional yeah. in their foreign assistance work and that the U.S. should be transformational. Yeah. Take us through, like, what might this era look like? How do we avoid the traps yeah, of the well, Cold War? That's a really great question. So I would say... Um, so what I would say is I think in this new moment, so I think we are going to look back at many of your listeners who've been in the, in the international development business or the democracy and human rights business, um, in the last 30 years are going to look back on periods like the 1990s and the two thousands, even for whatever, as kind of a golden age of global development. And I think we don't sort of think of it in those terms because I think the work's never done. We're never fully satisfied. But if you look at sort of like the really big progress in global development, if you look at MCC, MCC, you look at sort of just the cell phone revolution, even, even with its, you know, there were several waves of democratic, you know, waves of democracy. The last 15 years have been so awesome. There's been this democracy recession that's been pretty darn long and depressing and discouraging. But if, but if you take from like 1980 to today, it's still a lot freer world. There's more people free and it's a lot not free, more countries are more democratic. If you look at the, the Freedom House Index, if you go from 1980 and if you look at, say, OK, the GMP per capita or the levels of education or the levels of health over like a 20, even a 20 year period, it's better. In almost every not every country, there's like a series of failed states and people like Paul, um, Collier talk about the bottom billion and it's a pretty good failure, a significant failure. There's probably, I don't know, a dozen or two dozen countries that are pretty broken and 
are really a mess and, you know, are, are kind of their own special category. And we should talk about that. But I would just say that um, what I think it looks like is, yeah, I think we're going to have things that mimic a lot of the, we're going to have to make some hard choices like we did in the Cold War, which, which we've seen and kind of play out in like the Middle East. Like we often for many years would kind of say we'd look the other way about who governed Egypt. And I think we're kind of doing that still today. Or we look at the, you know, a number of other kind of countries kind of east of the Suez and we say, okay, well, they're doing other things. They do other things for us. They give us a military base or we have access to the Suez Canal or their military allies or they produce oil or gas and they help us. And we don't necessarily like everything about them and we don't fully trust everything about them, but, but this is, this is probably as good as it gets and compared to what, and so we just say we're just going to kind of take a pass. And so I think that's not great, but I worry that we're going to see a larger footprint of countries in the world. I could look at Central Asia as a place like that. There may be, you know, maybe some of the pulling back in some places in Latin America where you're seeing us kind of like push a lot less hard on kind of bad, bad actors and say, well, maybe we're, you know, we got other fish to fry. So maybe, so I think you're going to see less. I think we're going to see investments in democracy, human rights and governance, but I don't necessarily think... I don't know. I just think, uh, I, I know the Biden administration cares about this. President Biden cares about this. He's had, he's having a second, uh, democracy summit this year. I think it's a good thing at, on one level, but do I think we're going to kind of like, you know, are we going to be kind of less emphatic about it? At least if, you know, I think we'll see, but I think that that's something I worry about. Well, especially with the energy transition, which you talk a little bit about yeah. in the book, but this idea that there may be a scramble now for some of the rare earth minerals, some of the other, you know, mining commodities that are key for making solar panels or making batteries. And that, as you describe in the book a bit, China has been very strategically, you know, scooping them up, right. And aligning their, their foreign assistance strategy, their diplomatic strategy to try to get access to, to these kinds of natural resources, a lot of which are in low and middle income countries. And so it sounds like what you're saying is, hey, as that becomes a higher priority for the United States, for the West in yeah. general, for donor countries yeah. in general, that you'll end up seeing, you know, maybe some of the focus on human rights or democracy fall by the wayside. Is that, I, I is think that that's a real hard choice. Out? I mean, I think, I think, if you are concerned about climate change and you want to see a carbon transition happen, and if you don't love mining to the tips of your toes, it's like a bullshit conversation. And I think one of the things I worry about is I think a lot of the conversation about carbon transition has not fully priced in the realities of mining, that decarbonization does not mean dematerialization. And so um, we're going to have a lot of hard choices like this, at least with the current technology constraints that we're under like it requires a hell of a lot more copper we're going to have to do a lot of metals processing 40 percent of the world's metals processing are in china so what we're asking the the west to do and other other countries is say okay stop depending on venezuela iran and saudi arabia and we're going to switch that to mainland china and so that's i think the choice for unless unless you know and most of my friends in the aid world and the development community would rather get a root canal than work on a mining project. Like how many people do you know? Like, Oh my gosh, I love mining com community development projects. There's a lot of aid agencies. I don't think the world bank gets super excited about mining. How many projects has the Exxon bank or the DFC done in mining in the last two years? Now they're saying they're going to do more. That's great. But how many have they done? Zero. How much does AIDs, how much ODA do we spend on minerals, sustain, minerals for sustainable development? Rather, what we often do is say, well, we're just not going to play because it's such a loser of a topic. We're, we're going to piss off some, we're going to piss up the local community. There's oftentimes native peoples involved. There's all sorts of environmental headaches that the local communities often feel like they get screwed in terms of how much money they're getting. And so why do it? So if you're in the aid world, it's like, this is like a high risk thing. Well, like, okay, so guess what? If we're going to go and produce four, t four times as much mining is going to have to happen. You want given all the electric batteries we're supposed to have and all the iPhones we're going to have and all the defense stuff we're going to need to do. Well, who's going to help us do that? So are we going to allow other, so like I said, like ver leadership is a choice. So great power competition is also going to happen in minerals. So are we going to be in hock to the Chinese Communist Party and the Russians for all this metals for the carbon transition? Hell no. 
I don't think it's acceptable. So until I see, you know, a department of mining for the carbon transition happen in the World Bank, until I see like an assistant administrator bureau for mining for the carbon transition at AID, I think this is like not a serious discussion. Like I think that I think a lot of this is like a, not a fully serious discussion about the carbon transition. Like if you don't price in the the material components and the constraints. And so the aid community has got a big responsibility. Like, tell me what, how much you love mining and I'll tell you how much you love, you're really serious about the carbon transition. And I don't see a lot of people like lining out the door saying, I love mining. I don't see it. You know, a lot about USAID, yeah. you got a whole chapter dedicated to in the book. Um, what's wrong with USAID? <laughs> so, <laughs> what's ailing this agency? What would you do? Yeah. You talk a little bit about some of the, the yeah. reforms you would make, but take us through your your thinking about USAID and what, what needs to be done to make it fit for purpose. So I think there's a lot of people who love to hate AID in Washington. I think a lot of people in the military, so some people in the military appreciate them, some of them don't appreciate it. There are a lot of people in the State Department that don't like that it's sort of kind of semi-autonomous. They don't like that. Um, there are other kind of rivalry. There's stupid interagency rivalries and things that are unproductive. I also think I like AID. AID treated me really well. I had a really positive experience there. Uh, it's been, it's, uh, it's my, uh, I wish the agency really well and I want them to do well. So I've been a, if you read the book, you'll see, I've got a positive bias towards the agency. I think historically they've, they've, they've recruited, you know, there are, you know, just like any other large bureaucracy, there's some really strong people and there's some less strong people. And some of it's that. And sometimes it's things like, um, I think we all need to operate with some levels of humility. And I think sometimes the aid world, the ODA world in particular, think they're the largest wallet in the room. And as you know, Raj, we haven't been the largest wallet in the room in terms of sort of the enterprise of development, I think, since the early 1960s, like in terms of globalization or the amount of taxes collected, so-called domestic resource mobilization. A lot of basic human needs can be financed today by governments. So our kind of contribution, we're always we were always somebody supporting actor in someone else's movie with development. We're, we're someone else. We're a supporting actor in someone else's drama. But or epic, if you will. But. We sometimes think, no, we're the, you know, we're the largest funder and, you know, you should kind of, you know, we have to kind of have some. So I think sometimes there's a sin around that, that kind of we over the agency. A lack of humility. A lack of humility. Some of it is there's just been a combination, of, an accumulation of barnacles on rules and they've had their, fa there, there have been so many bad experiences and then people who don't follow this for a living and your listeners will appreciate this, you know, they go home at Thanksgiving and they've seen something in the press about some fiasco. And I also think there's sort of some mythology in Washington of like, oh, I remember the story from 19, it's like Republicans have a thing for this in particular where I'll have Republicans who are like kind of vaguely aware of it. I'm like, this stuff doesn't, why do you work on that stuff? You should work on defense. Like this, this isn't, this isn't. I also think the soft power thing for Republicans, like I've had like serious responsible Republican people. And I've said like, I want to talk about soft power. Very serious person, I'm not going to mention, who was an elected official, who's not an elected official anymore, looked at me and who, like, had worked in various kind of aid agencies. I was just kind of narrow to the universe of people. Looked at me disdainfully and said, soft power? I'd rather talk about hard power. And it was like, but I, I actually disagree with that. But it makes it feel, you know, the DevX listeners will understand what I'm trying to get at. So I think... You know, s some people in the Republican Party are like, oh, I remember some chicken coop project in Haiti and it went awry and or there was some other fiasco and they'll kind of like hold on to that and say like, this is kind of proof that all this aid stuff doesn't work. Now, your DevX listeners are like, well, there's this thing called PEPFAR or if you look at it's a lot of the medical stuff or you looked at Plan Columbia or even kind of if you kind of take the totality over the last three years of responding to COVID, I think we've kind of over time quietly filled the zone or responding to emergencies or um, so the earlier successes in places like Korea, Taiwan, or some of the, many of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe in particular, I think those are successes of development where we had a role to play in that. So, you know, so some of it is they have a skeptical problem. So some of it is they have these barnacles of, of kind of these accumulated regulations and rules. Some of it is they've had these bad experiences. So they're more timorous as a result, because, you know, you don't get rewarded for having screwing up. And, and then I also think, look, I'm, I'm not against 
I, I'm a little bit weird in the sense that I think, uh, I actually think having a large system of contractors and NGOs is like the develop, the defense industrial base. We have a development industrial base. Now, a lot of people in the aid community bristle at that. Yeah. Hey, you talk about it as a good thing. In the I think it's a good thing. It's like, it's like Boeing and Northrop Grumman and, I don't know, TRW or whoever these company, Rockwell, who do all this stuff like Patriot missiles and make F-35s. Guess what? We're going to respond to, am I hiring, without being too flippant about this, I hope your listeners will forgive me, but am I really hiring mom and pop NGO to deliver the the COVID that has to require like a super cold, complicated cold chain? There's a reason we hire large development consulting firms to develop big global, you know, cold chain supply chains because you can't just hire somebody locally to do that. I understand there's a variety of impulses on, on the, on the so-called localization agenda. And I think there are times and places for that, but I think uh, it would strike me as like, I don't think the solution to the problems of aid are the, is the localization agenda. And if you ask me like, where are people spending their political capital in the Biden administration development? It, it often feels to me as if most of the political capital, maybe I'm just hearing things wrong is on the localization agenda. And that strikes me as, as kind of a third tier issue at, at best. I think you could say, yeah, we probably, it's probably not necessarily good for us on the, just like in the defense world, it's not necessarily good for us to be dependent on like 20 defense contractors. We're probably, it's not necessarily in our interest to be dependent on 20 development NGOs and contractors. There's some downsides to that system too. Let me, let me try to articulate maybe a response to that just so I can hear how you, how you think about it. So yeah. my, my guess is the people who are big proponents of localization would say, if we actually care about long-term development results and not just getting credit for the U.S. government's efforts, but really getting to the result, you can't bring in a parallel system that works kind of alongside a health ministry to deliver COVID vaccines. You've got to build up that health ministry or you've got to build up that civil society of patient advocate groups that help to reform their health ministry. You need to build the domestic capabilities in a country and that the current model is so focused on funding big international organizations that you miss that indigenous domestic local capacity building systems building accountability and transparency that's needed for countries to kind of actually move into a true development phase and if you're not careful you end up with kind of what we had in afghanistan where you build you know you spend enormous sums you build parallel systems but none of it takes What's your response to that? So is th this idea that localization isn't just a third tier issue, it's kind of the core. So I, I understand that argument and I can think of places like Haiti. So another place would be like Haiti where there's like this problem where like we don't have any capacity of a government, the whole country is run, and I talk a little bit about it in the book, is run by NGOs. So we don't want that. I agree with that. So I think, I do think I would also say I did a report maybe 10 years ago when I talk about it in the book that didn't win me a lot of friends that basically said we have a defense industrial base, we have a development industrial base. Capacity building doesn't necessarily have to mean that the money has to flow through the pipes of the organization, that we sometimes conflate those two things. Uh, I do think... Uh, I do think there are many, there are a number of contexts where we should be working with local partners or empowering local partners. But my pushback on this, like, if we're serious about that, then like, why is it so darn hard to work through like the, you know, why don't you fix the regulatory thing of the federal government? So there's like lots of like games that are, I think are being played with this thing. So I would say there's some games going on. And I think if we were really serious about it, we would say, okay, we're going to have to probably hire a lot more bodies to babysit a lot of smaller grants. And if we were really serious about it, you would look at like the regulations involved with actually doing business with the federal government, which is like really difficult and take that on. Instead, what we say is like, okay, 20 or so implementers, like you solve my problem. The other thing I think we have to think about is this system arised because I think it's solving for a problem. And I think the problem it's solving for is the following, that when I go home at Thanksgiving, I have to explain to my parents who are very thoughtful people, like, you know, this development stuff, is this money all down a rat hole for people who aren't in the biz, who don't pay their mortgages on this stuff? There's a lot of skepticism. And so every time there's a corruption scandal, there needs to be some sort of an accountability. So if we say, I'm going to write a check to mom and pop and I'm being a little flippant, sorry, but I'm going to write a check to mom and pop NGO in XYZ country, and then they abscond with the money. What do we do about that? Do we issue an Interpol thing? 
sounds like bottom line, you're saying localization is probably a fad. I think it's a fad. It happened. And there's a particular fad to it among Democratic administrations. Uh, it happened in the Obama administration. It expresses itself a little bit in the Bush administration, a little bit around like we have 20 of these things. We ought to do something about it. You had tw you had a conversation, uh, the thoughtful people in the Trump administration, we have 20 organizations, why we have 20. And then you've got a variety of ways it expresses itself in sort of the aid community and the advocacy community and in the administration that is a little bit more of a fad. Like do I, what percentage of this stuff is like spent through local groups right now? Is it like you tell me is it like 3% or 5%. And there was a lot of huffing and puffing about this during the Obama administration. And th there's a reason I think for that. And I think the issue is around accountability. So one, so one thing we know is if there's a president, Nikki Haley, or President Ron DeSantis, yeah. and there's a USAID administrator, Dan Rundy. Well, that's got a guy a good ring to it. Localization <laughs> will not be. It will not be a top. It's issue not going to be my that, top issue. In no, that no, and I yeah, I would say, I, I just say. So the reason I wrote this book is to say, we need. I think there's like a handful of issues where we need to get religion. One is on mining. So I think if you're concerned about one of my messages to your listeners is like if you're concerned about climate change, you got to get religion on mining. And the aid community has to get super duper religion on mining in a whole different set of dimensions. And we need to make it a big part of our conversation. The second is we need to close the digital divide. I don't want the digital rails of the future run by Huawei, ZT, and Alipay. The third is I don't want to sit in my basement again for a year. And I hope everybody who's listening to this doesn't want to do that either. We need like real early warning systems. And then we need to have like the equivalent like Coca-Cola franchises of like vaccines. It's more fancy than that. I know the public health people would, probably don't like me saying it's Coca-Cola franchises. But basically what we need are Singapore and Uruguay and Panama and somebody else with like really good intellectual property rights, excellent infrastructure, a highly educated workforce and a teeny population and a stable governance to produce enough vaccines to cover themselves in like 20 minutes. And then everything else is for exports so that we don't have Guatemala waiting for 12 months again. So I want a better early warning system and I want a network of swing capacity in other places. Cause we cannot, we can complain about vaccine nationalism, but guess what? I don't believe any elected official, any progressive or conservative is going to be like, Oh, Pittsburgh or Paraguay. I'm giving it to Paraguay. I don't believe that. Only in authoritarian regimes like the Chinese Communist Party or Vladimir Putin's murderous regime can we get away with that. You know, we, we talked in the first book club episode about migration coming from climate. Wow. And the idea that we could have not just millions, but maybe billions of people needing to move as the climate shifts and places in the world become uninhabitable. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about your take on this as, as we kind of come to a close, because we had a question from a reader, James Carley, on Twitter about... The idea that people are coming north. Yeah. And they're coming north from places like Central America. Totally. Um, is there going to be a more coherent Republican view that aligns with your view on soft power that kind of brings some kind of humane immigration plan together so it's consistent? Or is this going to be, we've got a, a soft power play that's kind of con confronting China, but at the same time we're building a big wall and and we're we're pulling up the drawbridge. Yeah. We did a big exercise. We did two. I did two one-year exercises on migration. One just looking at Central America, and uh, it's um, it was in 2015, 2016. Uh, people can find it at CSIS. And then we did a big exercise, a global exercise, looking at the global migration issue at the beginning of the Trump administration. And we had a commission. We had Tom Ridge and we had Gail Smith do it. Um, after kind of overseeing. I didn't do all of them, but overseeing something like 200 interviews and visiting 10 countries and writing a whole bunch of papers about this. And I, I did probably myself, probably 50 interviews. My deepest thought is 8,000. So 8,000 is the number when a country, $8,000 per capita is when people stop migrating. We don't have a migration challenge from Costa Rica. We don't have a migration problem with Panama. We actually net net Maso Menos don't really have a problem with Mexico. We don't have a migration problem from any of these countries. There, actually, there's more, at least pre-COVID, there are more people going back to Mexico. Some of it's about migration, some of it's about demographics, and some of that's about development. And so to the extent we don't have a migration problem from Ireland, or if you want to call it a problem, or Italy. Like, we don't have people migrating anymore because there's not enough, they stop, you know, stop making kids. But some of us, they hit $8,000. And so Guatemala's at 4000 El Salvador's at 4000 and Honduras is 2500 So you tell me when... What's it going to take 
to have like a, you know, a bipartisan agreement in whatever the political system is in Guatemala on kind of a series of things to invest in people and, and to enable jobs and growth. And when it hits $8,000 per capita, we're going to have a lot less people migrating. Yes, there's a gang and security problem that's associated with it. And some of that's on us because we consume illicit narcotics. And some of it's because we deported a bunch of folks who then like went to like the Harvard University of like gang schools and jails. And then we exported them back to El Salvador and have, have created all sorts of problems for us. So we own some of this. We own a lot of this. And so I think, um, but I think ultimately this is, so the ultimate pro solving of migration is development. At the same time, I think, I do think that, um, you know, people have a right to say, we, we've got, this, this is a border. We're going to respect our border. And we've got international laws about things like migration and refugees. And there are certain rules about like, are you supposed to go to one country and this is the neighboring country? You've even seen this with the Biden administration recently. So I, I hear, I hear the question. It's a legitimate question. I don't think, uh, I do think, I think part of the issue is will that $8,000 in an era of climate shifts and heat waves and yeah. wet bulb, you know, people just can't yeah. live in these places instead of 8,000, maybe it's going to be 20,000. Maybe, maybe it's that, but I also <laughs> think it's like a climate adaptation thing. I don't think, I think we're going to have to think about like, what does adaptation look like? Is it like flood infrastructure or is it drought resistant seeds or flood resistant seeds? So I think you're right. So it, it's certainly going to shit that, you know, in theory, this will, this could easily be a different number because of these, these concerns that you raise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as I wrote in my look ahead piece for 2023, I just feel like there, in many ways, we're entering a new era, and, and this book really makes that case that the, the way we talk about and think about global development, and certainly this book is coming very much from a U.S. perspective, yeah. USG, but inside it, the Beltway, inside the Beltway, but you know, it's still it's such a valuable perspective. It's the world's largest economy and country, and and donor and just getting that insider take on it is so useful and i just want to really thank you dan for for taking the time to be part of the devx book club today and having this conversation it's been fantastic i'm so grateful to you raj you're awesome this is great devx is such a great product and i really appreciate it. appreciate your friendship and partnership this has been great what a great conversation thanks man thank you Dan Rundy is the Senior Vice President and the William A. Schreier Chair in Global Analysis at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS. Follow him on Twitter at Dan Rundy. Thank you all for joining. If you like the podcast, please share with your friends and give us five stars. And we really do want to hear from you. Please leave your thoughts in the comments or send me a message on Twitter at Raj underscore DevX. To learn what we're reading next, make suggestions for future guests, or submit questions for authors, be sure to sign up for our DevX Book Club mailing list, which you can find in the description of the show wherever you're listening to this. If you care about global development issues and you want the latest news, don't forget to subscribe to the DevX Newswire at the link in the comments, where you'll get the day's top global development breaking news, analysis, and opinion, as well as the date of the next book club. Until then, do good out there, and thanks for joining.